Thank you so much for this invitation. It's, a, it's an honor to be here giving the Zelton lecture. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very much delighted always to be uh, in front of a also German audience. I wish we could meet in person, but hopefully, hopefully in the future. So today I will tell you uh, about four recent projects um, to show you that we can learn a lot about how people think about the economy using social economic surveys and experiments. Um, so, as Benny alluded to, I have done these projects with my co-authors through the Social Economics Lab at Harvard. And many of you work in, in similar areas. Uh, the reason I call it social economics is because it's about how people think, reason, and form views about economic policies and issues based on considerations that go beyond the individual uh, that are linked to society and social phenomena. And clearly, a lot of our work as economists focuses on the very important question of what policies do or how they should be um, based on economic or observational data. And you know, we're trying here to add really a third angle to this and also look at policy based on the perceptions of people and their mental model uh, with novel methods uh, like surveys and experiments, which are made possible today thanks to the internet, thanks to large scale diffusion methods that I'll tell you about. And in a sense, it's a bit of a invitation to listen to people um, and understand how they think. And I'm not saying that in an idealistic or wishful way, but rather as a research tool. And why are surveys really such a, such a key tool? Um, there, as you know, some things which are invisible in other data, no matter, no matter how good it is. And um, you know, as economists, we typically prefer using revealed reveal preference approaches uh, where we back out, for instance, preferences or beliefs uh, from observed behaviors. And we may even have some sort of intrinsic mistrust of surveys, especially if we think about electoral polls, um, how wrong they went in recent years, or old style surveys, uh, which were used to measure things that today we can see much better in administrative data, like income, transfer receipts, etc. And in principle, you know, our revealed preference methods could play a role. Uh, you know, one can imagine writing a fully structural parametric model of our beliefs, of our thinking, and then use observational data on a range of behaviors and estimate the underlying unobservables. The problem is for many issues, this not only requires a lot of assumptions and, uh, and structure that we don't yet know about, but also a large set of real world variation that we don't actually have. So we're not asked every day to vote directly on a lot of separate issues. So a lot of the real world variation that we may need is actually missing. And a lot of policy views actually hinge on sort of higher order beliefs, what we think others may do, how we think others may be impacted, things that we will actually never reveal through our market transactions. So for instance, when it comes to supporting tax policies, we may wonder will high income earners gain or lose uh, how will they respond to tax changes, etc. And so if you care about those things, um, our other methods won't really get us there. So this is a long way of saying that surveys are perhaps a more direct way of eliciting these intangibles. And like other methods, they have strengths and they have weaknesses, and they can actually be great when, uh, when deployed appropriately. So of course, for the results to be um, reliable, it's critical that these surveys are well designed carefully calibrated and run on appropriate samples. And hopefully I'll give you an idea during this lecture how we try to always um, have customizable, controllable, interactive, uh, well-designed surveys. And in the Q&A, if you have more questions about this, there's plenty I can say about um, the design, the quality of the sample, et cetera. So another advantage here, by the way, is that there's always the scope of collecting more data uh, it's a very flexible tool. Um, so if I, for instance, forgot your preferred question, or if there's something you were burning to know, it's always possible to collect more sample and, and get those questions. So if you're interested in more such work beyond what I'll cover today, uh, you can go on the Social Economics Lab website where I've tried to put all the projects, often also the data, um, if you want to play around with it. So the projects that I want to tell you about today um, which each will be relatively brief, but I want to give you some overview of different issues. The first will be on intergenerational mobility and preferences for redistribution, joined with my uh, 
great colleague and friend who very sadly passed away this year, Alberto Alesina, and Eduardo Tesso, who's at Northwestern Kellogg. The second on immigration and redistribution, again with Alberto and our grad student Armando Miano. The third, just by myself, uh, on understanding tax policy. And then the fourth, joined with uh, Christopher Hwidberg, who's on the market this year, and Klaus Kreiner from the University of Copenhagen on social position and fairness views. So they would be quite different and quite complementary, I think. So let's dig into the first project on intergenerational mobility and preferences for redistribution. This project was actually done right after the 2016 election in the US when there was a lot of debate about the possibly crumbling American dream. But where we started from was actually from this stereotypically documented gap in views between on the one side Americans, um, to make it simple, and continental Europeans uh, on the right here. Where Americans are typically pictured to think that the economic system is mostly fair, that the American dream is alive and well, that wealth is the reward for ability and effort, um, and that if you're poor, it's mainly due to your inability to take advantage of opportunity, and that effort, if you put it in, will pay off. And then stereotypically, it's believed that Europeans think the opposite. The econ system is basically unfair. Wealth is due to your family history or connections or sticky social classes. Poverty is due to bad luck or society's inability to help you and your effort may or may not pay off. And yet we now have much better data on social mobility collected by many people across different countries, for instance, uh, by Rash Chetty for the US and intergenerational mobility, at least today, is absolutely not systematically higher in the US than it is in Europe. So that prompted us to think, do people actually have realistic views about mobility? And you know, if we branch out beyond the pure quantitative views on mobility, what are their views on fairness? How fair is it? Um, how many chances do people have of making it? What's the role of effort versus luck? And then importantly, what is the link between perceived mobility or mobility um, and your preferred redistribution policy. Existing theories suggest that, you know, the more you believe in equality of opportunity, i.e. that everyone has equal chances to start with, then the more willing you are to tolerate an equality of outcomes. Because if everyone has the same opportunities to start with, then outcomes are more likely to be the result of individual merit. And so we want to explore this link in a first correlational descriptive sense, but then also causally by trying to shift people's views on mobility experimentally. And so what we do is to actually run these large scale online surveys in five countries here, France, Italy, Sweden, the UK and the US. You will notice the blatant omission of Germany, which we'll make up for in the next in the next project. Uh, so bear with me with samples here ranging between 2000 and 4000 respondents. Uh, which were done around September, October 2016. And the survey structure in all these countries is as follows. Uh, first, we ask respondents about their socioeconomic background, their age, gender, family situation, their own experience of mobility, their political views, etc. Then uh, we ask them about some core views on fairness, um, about you know how fair they think the economic system is, do people have a fair chance of making it, and then we show them randomized information on mobility, which will basically make them more pessimistic about mobility. It will shift everyone in the direction of thinking there is less mobility. Then we elicit in detail their perceptions of what mobility is so that we can control, we can compare the control and treatment groups. Then we ask them about policy views, um, which we do in three, in three steps. First, the overall size of the government and involvement that people want then how should taxes be raised, given that we need to raise a given amount of revenues, so how to allocate the tax burden, and then how to spend a given amount of revenues. I will very often follow this three-step uh, split, because if you mix everything together, if you say, oh, should people pay higher taxes, or should we have more spending on this or that, unless we constrain a given budget, or we constrain there to be a given revenue that needs to be raised, the answers could be, of course, very unrealistic. And so having this three-step split of the total size versus how to split a given tax burden versus how to allocate a given spending allows you to control each of the parts when you ask about one given part. 
And then we also asked them about their views of the government, which will turn out to be very key predictors of their views on policy. So as I alluded to in the introduction, um, a lot of work goes into the design of the question. And so I'll try to illustrate it with specific examples from each project. So here, for instance, uh, we wanna ask them about what they think about mobility and how can we get you know, a question that's intuitive, clear and unbiased. So here's how we do it for actual intergenerational mobility. So we show people this ladder picture here and explain in a text above um, that they should consider 500 families that represent the US population or the population of any of the countries in the sample. And on the left, we can see the parents' income distribution ranging from the poorest 100 families all the way to the 100 richest. And on the right, we can see the children' income distribution when the children grow up once they're adults. Again, ranging from the 100 poorest to the 100 richest. And we ask people to consider 100 children born in the bottom poorest families and to allocate them to each of the ladder's rungs to say where they will grow up to be. And the answers are constrained to add up to 100 here so that people have to give meaningful answers and they have to allocate those 100 kids. So what comes out of this? Let me start by describing those perceptions. So let's start with a perceived probability of remaining in poverty, i.e. remaining stuck in the bottom quintile. So what do people enter here in the bottom rung of the ladder? So on this figure, you can see one dot per country uh, on the x-axis, these are the actual probabilities of remaining stuck in the bottom quintile. So for instance, in the US, which is the red dot, 33 children out of 100 will remain in the bottom quintile. That number is 27 for Sweden, which according to this metric has the highest mobility. In general, European countries have higher mobility here than the US. On the y-axis, we can see the average perception across respondents in that country. So I have labeled the upper region pessimistic because that's where people tend to underestimate mobility or equivalently to overestimate the probability of remaining in poverty. The lower area by contrast is optimistic. So where people actually overestimate mobility. So what we can see is that the US is relatively accurate on that dimension but European respondents really tend to overestimate the probability of remaining stuck in poverty. So they're not only more pessimistic than the US, which we already intuitively knew, but they're also overly pessimistic relative to reality in their countries. So we can also look at another metric, namely the so-called American dream, this idea of making it from rags to riches. So we can measure that by how many children people think will make it from the bottom quintile to the top quintile. So in this chart, again, on the x-axis, this is the actual probability of a child born in the bottom making it to the top. And you can see that the American dream is actually least alive in the US. The US is to the left here. Uh, in the US, around 7.8 7 out of 100 children will make it from bottom to top. And yet European countries, are actually, oh, European countries are actually quite accurate on this. They perhaps <laughs> underestimate mobility a little okay. bit. Um, they perhaps underestimate mobility a little bit. Uh, so they're a bit too pessimistic, but not by a lot. However, you can see that the US really overestimates that mobility. So this idea of the American dream is very salient in the US, even though it's not necessarily true in reality. And I won't show this in a, in a figure, but one thing uh, that we ask people is to fill out this latter question um, with asking people to think about someone who's putting in a lot of effort. Uh, so to test whether people think that effort matters, we ask them, you know, think specifically about children from the bottom quintile that will put in a lot of effort first in school, then in their job, and to fill out what mobility they think those kids will have. And what we see is that most people across countries believe quite a lot that effort will improve mobility, uh, but in a specific way. Namely, people tend to believe that it will help you get out of poverty, so effort will get you out of the bottom quintile and will even get you into the middle class, but very few people actually believe that effort will get you to the top. And that's quite consistent across countries. So what does this imply for policy? Well, recall that we're gonna look at this 
first in, in a pure correlational sense, and then causally as well. So in terms of correlations, what we can do is to relate um, the, the perceived uh, mobility that we just elicited uh, as measured either by your pessimism, so your perceived chance of remaining stuck in the bottom, or your optimism, your perceived chance of moving to the top quintile, uh, to, your pro to your views on progressive policies. So we have a range of policies in the paper, but here we can look, for instance, at the top tax rate. So in this figure, the two panels are bin scatters. So people are grouped either by their pessimism on the left or on their pessimism, on the optimism about mobility on the right. And each dot shows you within that level of optimism or pessimism, the average preferred top tax rate in this bin. Uh, and so what we can see is that those who are more pessimistic on the left about mobility support more redistribution as measured by a higher top tax rate. And exactly the opposite happens on the right. Those who are more optimistic about mobility support a lower top tax rate. There's many other policies in the paper and they work very consistently. So you would see the perfect mirror image if you ask about the rate on the bottom 50% of people about spending on um, health, on education, on social insurance programs, et cetera. In fact, if we look at spending on so-called equality of opportunity policies, things that are there to improve chances like education or health, what share of the budget people want allocated to that is very strongly related to their views on mobility. And so what will happen in the experiment where we show people uh, pessimistic information on mobility is that we will, they will actually move people along this x-axis. So it will make people more pessimistic and we will basically recover that correlational pattern. Uh, so people who are made more pessimistic by the treatment support more redistributive and progressive policies, whether it's higher top tax rates or more spending on equality of opportunity policies. But there is one subtlety and something we didn't necessarily expect, but that exposed actually turned out to be quite uh, important and perhaps, um, perhaps obvious. So the pattern here that you see on these graphs actually only holds for left-wing respondents across all countries. So people who'd say they're politically on the left, you know, whether it's Democrats in the US or other left-wing parties in Europe, those are the people who show this pattern. On the other hand, that pattern is pretty much flat for right-wing respondents and at much lower support for progressive policies and levels as well, which means, you know, among right-wing respondents, there is heterogeneity in perceived mobility, of course, but those who are more pessimistic about mobility don't support more government redistribution policies. And exactly that will appear in the experiment too. While the experiment has a very strong and significant, you know, effect on left-wing respondents' policy views, on right-wing respondents, it only has a very strong first stage effect, which is, yes, it does shift their views on mobility. So it makes them more pessimistic about mobility, but it doesn't change their views on policies. And that's very much in contrast uh, between left-wing and right-wing respondents across all countries. So in a sense, you know, about redistribution, it's a bit like either teaching to the choir, as we say, to the already preaching to the converted, or actually, you know, giving information to people who disagree with redistribution policies to start with. So we tried to dig a bit further into what can explain this. And we tried to map the negative views about uh, government that people on the right have across countries. So in a sense, you know, people on the right across countries tend to view the government as a bit more part of the problem rather than as part of the solution. So on this graph, just very briefly, you can see uh, a summary of views of government where all countries are pulled together. Uh, the left, the left wing respondents within countries are in blue, the right wing are in red. And you can see the share of respondents on the X axis that agree with the statements listed on the left. And these are all turned into the negative direction about government. So for instance, you can never trust the government in the first row or that the government has no tools or that people prefer a lower government intervention or in the bottom row answering yes to at least one of these questions. And so you can see in the next to last row that you know no one on the left or right thinks that unequal opportunities are not a problem. Everyone agrees they are a problem. But in the middle row, you see this fundamental disagreement 
uh, a very big partisan gap in how much government intervention is desired and in this idea of trickle down, namely that lowering taxes and letting the economy function freely will do more to reduce inequality of opportunity than will raising taxes and redistribution. So there's a fundamental disagreement about what the solution to low mobility is. And there was this book in the US that came out around the, the election um, that's in a nutshell summarizing this message, which is this quote from J.D. Vance uh, in the book Hillbilly Elegy, which is yet the message of the right is increasingly, it's not your fault that you're a loser, it's the government's fault. And we thought that could actually perhaps explain um, that there's a very strong first stage effect between left and right wing respondents. Everybody starts believing there's lower mobility, but no effect on policy preferences. And that these worst views of governments, which we know are correlated with lower support for redistribution. And we also know that right wing respondents have much worse views of the government and its role could perhaps be explaining this. So to sum up here for this project, the main findings are that Yes, Americans are more optimistic than Europeans about mobility, but more strikingly, Americans are too optimistic relative to their own reality, especially about the American dream idea, this idea of making it from rags to riches. Europeans are too pessimistic, especially about staying stuck in poverty. And people believe that effort matters, but not for making it to the very top. And importantly for policy, being more pessimistic about mobility or more optimistic is correlated with support for redistribution, especially quality of opportunity policies. And that, that link is causal, as the experiment shows when you make people more pessimistic. But that link and that causality is only there for left-wing respondents. So there's a very strong polarization in terms of seeing the same information, but having very different effects on policy views among left and right. So. Shifting gears, the second project is about immigration and redistribution. So here, um, you know, we focused on a topic that as many of you in the audience have also worked on and know was in the debate in many recent elections uh, in both the US and in Europe and is still in the debate. And many arguments centered uh, not just around the cultural considerations, which are very prevalent, of course, but also around the economic issues and to what extent immigrants contribute versus hurt public finances and our traditional welfare state. And so in this project, we try to study two questions. Um, first, how do people perceive, or should I rather say misperceive immigration? So are there perceptions about immigration, the number, their origin, their other economic characteristics accurate or not? Um, how does this differ by different groups of people? And then second, the question we're always after, what is the link between immigration views and views on redistribution? So there's theories that have been written uh, in political economy, also in political science, about the fact that generosity doesn't necessarily travel as well across national, ethnic, or religious lines, and that people support more redistribution when it, when it benefits or when they think it benefits those more like them more similar to them. So in this project, we will again run surveys, this time in six countries, adding Germany to the mix. And overall, we have more than 22,500 respondents. Uh, this was mainly done in November 2017 until March 2018. And here the surveys have the following structure. I'm explaining it in a little bit, a little bit more detail because it's important to understand the results. So first we ask people about their socioeconomic and demographic info, again, you know, about their age, gender, income, and also about their own immigrant, you know, background. Do they have immigrant parents? About their sector of work, so that we can map it to the immigrant intensity in their sector of work and their political views, among others. After that, people will be randomized into one of four branches. So the first branch will see information on the actual number of immigrants in their country. The second on the origins of those immigrants. The third will get an anecdote type treatment about uh, the day in the life of, the, of a very hardworking immigrant. So it will be a story, a narrative. And then the control group sees none of this. And then we have the immigration block, um, which first you know, elicits people's detailed perceptions about the number and characteristics of immigrants such as their origins, their religion, 
how hard they work, their unemployment, poverty, education levels, reliance on government transfers, etc. And then support for various immigration policies. And I want to mention that here we're quite detailed uh, intentionally. So of course we have questions such as do you support more or less immigration, but also more nuanced questions such as how long after they arrive uh, should immigrants be allowed to vote or to apply for citizenship or to receive transfers. And you know when people when people may consider them to be truly, for instance, American or truly part of the country, and also whether the government should care equally about immigrants and non-immigrants. So we want to allow for a nuanced set of views on this. Then we have the redistribution block, which is asking questions about people's views on income taxes, again, how to allocate the budget between different categories, as well as the total size of the government. And we also have a donation question where people are asked whether they want to donate some of their earning, earned money uh, on one of several charities. So the way this is done is that we tell respondents that they're enrolled in a lottery when they, when they take part of the survey to win $1,000. But before they know whether they have won, they, ha they have to commit whether they want to give uh, money to charity and how much, you know, they could give zero. And these charities that are chosen are picked so that they're not at all about immigrants. They're general charities about low-income respondents, for instance, Feeding, Feeding America in the US or Caritas in Germany. And finally, we also ask a range of detailed views of the government again. So we basically have uh, three types of treatments here, if you notice. The first is these information treatments on either uh, facts about the info, uh, facts about the number of immigrants or facts about the origins of immigrants. The second is an anecdote type treatment about, for instance, a day in the life of a hardworking immigrant. And then the other will be a pure priming treatment where we will just randomize the order in which we show people this immigration block here versus the redistribution block. And so that will turn out to be the most powerful treatment. Um, so respondents here will see the blocks in different orders. And in particular, respondents are not given any info about immigrants, but they're made to think through the characteristics of immigrants and the immigration questions first. So for the ones who see the redistribution block first, they have never been asked anything about immigration until that point before they answer the policy questions. Again, you know, a lot of thought goes into the design of these questions. And in particular, when we ask about the characteristics of immigrants, like their unemployment, their education, etc., we always also ask about the same statistic for non-immigrants. This is important so that we have a benchmark because respondents may be off, and in fact, they are off on many dimensions uh, and for specific economic variables, also for non-immigrants. So you don't want to assume that this is necessarily something about immigrants unless you also ask about non-immigrants. So it's the comparison between these two questions that will allow us to make some statements. And we also have very careful interactive question designs. For instance, you know, to elicit the share of immigrants, we have this uh, pie chart plus slider design. So when respondents land on the page, the pie chart is all gray and the slider is at zero. And as they move the slider, the pie chart will update to indicate in red how many people out of 100 currently living here in the US, for instance, are foreign born. So important to note that our definition of immigrants, which we repeat multiple times in the survey, is foreign born. This is to avoid issues related to different rules for citizenship or naturalization across countries. And for the US, we also make sure to always repeat legal immigrants because um, illegal immigration is a bigger issue. And we redid all the results for the US using total immigrants as well in the appendix and the results are just extremely similar. And so here as people move uh, the, the slider, the pie chart will adjust. So this is useful because it visually shows respondents how many immigrants they say they are. And it's naturally benchmarked because since whatever is not in blue is in red. And so they automatically also answer what share they think are non-foreign born. And similarly to elicit the views on the origins of immigrants, the question is a bit more complex, but it's the same spirit. So now the pie chart represents hundred immigrants currently in the country, and respondents have to indicate which regions these immigrants come from. And it's not shown here, but respondents uh, have on the top of their screen a map of the world where the regions are marked in exactly these same colors so that there's no ambiguity about which country is in which region. So what are some key results? 
Well, let's start with the perceived and actual number of immigrants by country that people think. So on this graph, each row is a country and the X axis represents the share of immigrants that is actually in the country in the blue diamond and the average perception of respondents from that country, that's the red square. Uh, the small shaded areas are actually confidence intervals around the average perception, so they're, they're very tight. You can see that in all countries, respondents very starkly overestimate um, the share of immigrants. So for instance, in the US, people think they're around 37% of immigrants, and in fact, you know, they're only 10% legal and up to 14% counting illegal immigrants. In Sweden, which is the country where there are most immigrants actually, respondents are also most accurate. In fact, you can add second generation immigrants to that figure and it still wouldn't close the gap. The gaps are just too large. So you may wonder which groups of respondents are more accurate. So we can see this on the next graph, uh, which is a bit harder to read. Here we have pulled together all countries, but split respondents into the groups which are shown in each set of rows. So for instance, in the bottom two rows, it shows the split by right wing versus left wing respondents. At the top, it indicates people in three groups, for instance, those not working in an immigration intensive sector, which employs many immigrants, those working in a high immigration sector, but that have a college degree, so more highly paid jobs, and those working in a high immigration sector, but without a college degree. And then the X axis directly shows you the misperception relative to each respondent's country, actual share of immigrants. So you can see, first of all, that all groups without exceptions are quite to the right. So all groups, overestimate the share of immigrants starkly, even the college educated. So there's no group that is not overestimating. And in fact, the minimum misperception is 15 percentage points. Second, you can see that the perceived share of immigrants in the bottom row is completely equally overinflated for left and right wing respondents. So the perceived share of immigrants turns out to be quite uncorrelated with policy views. We, we show that in the paper. What matters much more and what will be different for left and right is the perceived composition of immigrants. So let me go to that and let me next show you here the perceived share of Muslim immigrants. So note that none of these countries uh, in the sample is Muslim majority. And this is why I picked this particular statistic here to show. So people inflate the share of Muslim immigrants you know, across almost all countries. So for instance, in the US, people believe it's one quarter of all immigrants when it's in fact more like 10%. And the one exception is France, um, which has 50% of Muslim immigrants and is accurate on that. And that's you know, perhaps due to the more complicated colonial history. In the right panel, we again have this type of heterogeneity graph that we just saw. Uh, I would just like you to focus on the bottom row. Here you can see that there's a discrepancy between left and right wing respondents. So right wing respondents tend to overestimate the share of Muslim immigrants by more than left wing respondents do. So one interesting question is to what extent respondents perceive immigrants as relying on government transfers. So on this graph, you can see the share of respondents who think that the average immigrant receives at least twice the transfer amount of an average non-immigrant in their country. And actually in no country is this the case. Hence, we can immediately say the right answer should be zero here. Yet the share of respondents who think so is not small, except in Germany actually. And here again, if you look at the right panel in the bottom row, there is a very big gap here between left and right wing respondents when it comes to how much do immigrants rely on transfers relative to natives. We also asked some questions uh, that are targeted at seeing whether respondents are somewhat biased against immigrants, uh, because so far none of the question tells you about a bias necessarily. So here we tell the respondents explicitly about two identical men except that one is an immigrant and the other is not. Um, they are described to have the same family situation, same income, same age, living in the same place. And then we ask them whether they think that the non-immigrant called John and the immigrant called Mohammed pays the same amount of taxes or more or less and gets the same level of transfers more or less. Um, and here's the share of respondents who say that, yes, Mohammed gets more transfers and pays less taxes than John. And recall that based on the question, there's absolutely no basis for your respondents to think so. In fact, only Sweden gets it right here with 0% of respondents who think so. Countries like Italy or France, so a substantial bias here with more than 32, 33% of respondents 
who think that Mohammed gets more transfers and pays less taxes. And note that we actually randomized the immigrant name between, for instance, for the US, Mohammed, Felipe, and Jack. And it was actually consistent across the names. The starkest pattern was definitely for the name Mohammed. Okay, so to sum up this part on perceptions, um, people are basically overestimating the number of immigrants, and they also have a relatively wrong view about the characteristics of immigrants. So they tend to think, I didn't show you those in graphs, that immigrants are less educated, more likely to be unemployed, um, they rely more on government transfers, etc. And people are definitely also wrong about non-immigrants, but always systematically more so about immigrants. And an important point at the bottom here is that while left and right wing respondents don't differ in their already overinflated perceived share of immigrants, they definitely differ in their perceived composition of immigrants. Okay. Now let's switch to uh, the link between these perceptions and policy. And in particular, let's go straight to these experimental variations. So remember that we started uh, with the information treatments, uh, which show people the information, for instance, on the share of immigrants that's actually in their country. So this is a video, and it first tells them people what share of the population in your country is actually an immigrant, and then also benchmarks it relative to other OECD countries to show that their country is actually really somewhere in the middle. It's not at the extremes. The other information treatment tells people where immigrants come from. For instance, here in the US, it shows in different colors the share of immigrants from different regions of the world. So where the number of little stick figures here is proportional to the actual share of immigrants from that region. And then once this is done for all regions, the final screen summarizes the composition. Then comes an anecdote treatment, remember that tells people the, the, about the day in the life of a very hardworking immigrant. Um, it's just text with a clock at the top this immigrant works two jobs, takes care of their family, helps her kids, dreams of starting a small business one day. And so this is obviously intended to cater to the hardworking immigrant rhetoric. And it's an anecdote. Uh, it's a narrative. It's not factual by any means. It's much more emotional. Okay, so what do we find? Well, what we find is that the order treatment actually has very strong effects. The one where we randomized the order in which we show the redistribution questions and the immigration questions without giving people any information. So just making people think about immigrants makes them less supportive of redistribution, including even private charity donations. And this is very consistent with the negative baseline views people have of immigrants. So priming them to think about immigrants makes them less prone to redistribution. On the other hand, the factual information on either the share or the origins of immigrants has no effect and even a negative effect on policy views. This suggests that, you know, given the negative and substantial baseline misperceptions of immigrants, just those pieces of information one by one are not enough to correct all the negative views. And the priming effect uh, is stronger, since by providing info on immigrants, we unavoidably make people think about immigrants. So perhaps down the road, uh, a more comprehensive information treatment that tells people about more characteristics of immigrants could shift policy views. The anecdote treatment about this very hardworking immigrant works somewhat, but again, only for those people who get the redistribution block first. Once people are prompted to think in detail about immigrants and their characteristics, which they're wrong about, the priming effect will dominate. Okay, the third project is about how people understand tax policy. And this is actually part of a broader expedition I, I embarked upon to understand how people reason about economic policies. And the question that I'm trying to answer here is, what are the mental models that people use to think about tax policy or other economic policies? What are the, you know, what is their knowledge, of course, but beyond that, how do they reason? What are the chains of thinking that go through their minds when they consider various policies? Why is this important? Well, when we think of what policies people support, uh, which is the sort of function here, your desired, say, tax policy, it can be a function of different things like you know, perceived efficiency effects, perceived distributional impacts, fairness views, many of which are in our models. But these factors could be different from our economists ones if people give different weight to them, have different perceptions of their values, uh, or have more you know, complex and augmented fairness considerations, et cetera. 
And understanding these mental models gives us some of the you know, advantages of more structural approaches relative to more reduced form approaches. So without being able to go all the way to a full-fledged structural model, it's a move in that direction. And once we have a bit more structure here and we understand the primitives better, we can better see where does this agreement lie? What shapes our policy views? And we can also see where could intervention be needed? For instance, if there are correctable gaps in knowledge or in consistent reasoning versus where we may decide to take things as given and accept things, for instance, if people just hold very different notions of fairness and very different views on what is fair. And so this is part, you know, as I said, of a broader agenda. So you can apply the same logic I'll show you here to other policies. Um, I looked at trade, I looked at health insurance, at the moment at macro policy and climate change environmental policies. And so if you're interested, you can actually browse this website, understandingeconomics.org, uh, where you can see the answers to various questions uh, by groups of respondents, and you can pull out the answers directly. So without putting more um, structure on this, uh, it's going to be obviously impossible to estimate a policy view function for every individual. What I'll do in this paper is actually elicit what I think are major relevant components of policy views, like perceived efficiency effects, distributional impacts, views of government, etc. Those will be my right-hand side variables, my explanatory variables, and I'll relate them to views of the tax system, policy views that will be my left-hand side variables. And so the steps to achieve them map immediately into the design of the survey that you see here graphically. So first, I ask respondents about their socioeconomic background, like demographic info, media consumption and exposure, political views, etc. Then I do something a bit unusual, which is to ask them open-ended questions that extract their first order reasoning uh, on policy, on the policy issue. The goal here is to see what comes to people's minds without me priming them to think in one direction or the other. And it gives us a sense whether these issues are different to a first order from we, what we economists think. Then I ask people a range of factual knowledge questions. For instance, you know, um, what they think the tax system currently looks like, what they think the income distribution looks like, etc. Then comes a part where I show people in a randomized way, very short video courses, econ courses, on how the tax system works to see, you know, how it then affects their reasoning and their policy views. I'll come back to this in a second. The most important part is this reasoning about taxes part. So here I took a deep dive into uncovering what people think about the efficiency costs of taxes, the distributional impact and their fairness concerns. It's a detailed series of questions on all of these. And I actually here randomized the formulation. So some people will be asked a generic formulation such as if taxes were to increase on high income respondents or if taxes were to increase on the middle class, what would happen? Who would gain? Would those people do this or that? The others are asked the me formulation. So if your taxes were to increase, if this change happened, would you gain, would you lose? So the idea is to test whether in general there are inconsistencies in how people think about themselves versus others. Then I ask about policy views. So recall that those will be my outcome variables. Like do people support higher taxes? On which groups? Are progressive taxes a good tool to reduce inequality? Would they support higher taxes to finance infrastructure? versus spending on lower income transfers, et cetera. And finally, ask questions about the views of government. So to recap, I will regress the policy views here, which will be my left-hand side variables, on all these components that I elicit, the knowledge, um, the views on redistribution, the views on fairness, the government trust, et cetera. And this will lead me to a decomposition of policy views into these various factors to see how much each matters. And to establish causality about the way in which these main factors enter uh, the policy views, that's where these randomized courses kick in. So these are some very short video courses that explain the effects in neutral balanced ways, the way we may do in a very super short introductory econ class, but they will focus on one aspect versus the other. So for instance, the redistribution treatment, and I'll show you some screenshots now to verbally explain the content. So the redistribution treatment We'll start by showing people you know, facts about the distribution of income here in the US, the share of earnings, for instance, that goes to the top 1%, 10%. And then it describes how a progressive tax system can reduce income inequality by taking some income from the top and redistributing it to lower incomes to finance, for instance, transfers. 
the efficiency treatment will focus only on the distortionary cost of taxes. So it stresses the possible costs in terms of reduced economic activity and then suggests different channels through which this can happen. For instance, people working less. Um, the video shows the example of a person who decides not to take a second job, people hiding most of their income from the tax authorities, people deciding to stop uh, looking for, for savings opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities, etc., and all these various options. And then the economist treatment will append these two videos and then show a concluding screen that will emphasize the trade-off between distributional benefits and efficiency costs. That's why it's called the economist treatment uh, in our own internal language here. So the scale here will weight on one side the benefits from taxes, uh, less inequality and more revenues against the economic costs. And the scale is moving in the video to show that the right tax system is the one that will balance these. And again, these treatments are not telling people what the current system is. They're not telling people what the tax system should be. They're simply explaining redistribution, efficiency, or the two things together. And so let me dig into some specific results quite briefly in the interest of time. Um, but for instance, I find it very curious to look at the open-ended questions. Uh, so to analyze these open-ended questions where people just write small like essays, essentially small, small paragraphs of text, you know, to questions such as what are your main considerations about the income tax? Or what are the major shortcomings of the income tax? Or what do you think, you know, are the major problems with the estate tax? It's very interesting to analyze those answers. Um, and so I do a lot of text analysis on those. I spare you the details. Then you can do either word clouds that show you the frequency uh, with which certain words appear or topic distributions. So let's look for fun, for instance, what people think the major shortcoming, so the major problem is with the estate tax in the US. The estate tax, remember, is the tax that's paid at death on wealth that's passed on for, from parents to their children. So this is what people think is the major issue with the estate tax. You can see that the major concern is that it's a double tax, that this is income that's already taxed. And to go deeper, let me show you, for instance, the topic distribution um, all the topics that are mentioned in answer to the question, what are your main considerations about the income tax? So here's the topic distribution. So the numbers here represent how many times a topic appears in the answers out of all topics. Um, and the frequencies are shown by political views, all the way from Clinton liberals in dark blue to Clinton moderates, Trump moderates, all the way to Trump conservatives in dark red. And these topic names here above each panel, they're given by me. So I don't expect people to mention the word efficiency, uh, but this, this would group keywords such as work less, work more, hurt economy, destroy jobs, etc. The distribution topic will be words like millionaires, billionaires, poor, rich, etc. You can see that some of the patterns are very monotonic. So for instance, distributional concerns, the top left panel, are very prevalent on the right. That's the major concern that comes to people's minds. And it declines as you move to the right. On the other hand, perhaps a bit disappointing for us, efficiency topic, the top right panel, is very, very minimal in people's minds. It's definitely not the first order thing that comes to people's minds. And then look at the second uh, panel uh, at the top, fairness. Fairness is mentioned by everyone equally across the spectrum. This is because everyone wants a fair system, but what's fair is very much in the eye of the beholder. In, in the spirit of showing you a bunch more results here, um, when it comes to knowledge about the current tax system, so remember we have this block with factual knowledge questions, a few, a few key facts. So on the income tax, people tend to really um, underestimate to what extent the US used to have high taxes. So in the left panel, it shows you people's average perception in, in blue and the reality in orange about the top tax rate today on the right versus in the 1950s. And people just don't realize to what extent the US used to have much, much higher taxes. In the right, people don't realize to what extent the top tax threshold starts very high. They think it kicks in much, much lower than it actually does. On the estate tax, which is on this slide, the major misperception is that people completely overinflate who pays the estate tax. They think many more people pay the estate tax than is actually the case, which is kind of consistent with this view um, that they think it's a double tax. 
And if you wonder who knows more, well, higher income respondents are much more aware about what's going on at the top. College educated respondents are also generally more accurate. And then there's a very interesting phenomenon, which I call the polarization of reality, which is that even on factual questions, like what is the tax rate? What is income inequality? Republicans and Democrats tend to have different views. These are things that you can go and Google, you know, potentially. Yet, you know, people on the right, Republicans tend to view taxes as higher and more progressive than Democrats do, and inequality as lower and not having increased as much. Importantly, no group is systematically more accurate than the other. Sometimes reality is in between, sometimes reality is all above or all below. But this relative ranking between the two groups is very stark. Another thing we find is that those who already know more are also willing to pay more for information. And that's actually consistent across many of the topics. Um, I find this very generally in many other surveys, which could emphasize why some misperceptions may be mis you know, persisting if those who already know more are also those who are willing to learn more. In very brief, if I walk you through the perceived efficiency and distributional effects and then the fairness effects, very briefly, there will be very large partisan gaps. So in general, Democrats will think much more uh, that taxes you know, have very few economic costs, um, that they don't change behaviors as much relative to Republicans. Democrats will in general tend to think that higher taxes overall or higher taxes at the top will help everyone. Republicans tend to think they will hurt more people. On fairness, again, there's very fundamental disagreements on whether inequality is a serious issue, whether high income should be entitled to keep their income, whether wealth inequality is a serious issue. And one thing that is a bit more complex that I want to focus on for just 20 seconds is on the estate tax. So many countries have some sort of estate or inheritance tax. And when you think of it, it poses very thorny fairness issues, depending on whether you take the perspective of children or parents. If you take the point of view of children, many people would agree that it's unfair for children to have access to better amenities or get more inheritances if they come from wealthier families. But, you know, when you take the perspective of parents, actually suddenly people think, oh, it's unfair to tax away the wealth of parents for which they've worked hard or for which they saved hard. But these two things are in fundamental conflict. You can't have both. And when you put people in front of the trade-off and you say, okay, you need to decide, do you prefer that children start with less equal opportunities, but then parents are allowed to pass their wealth tax-free, or do you prefer the opposite? There on balance, just 50% of Democrats come down on the side of, okay, let's let parents pass their wealth on tax-free, and 70% of Republicans do. But these are quite thorny issues, and by introspection, you can think where you would fall on that trade-off. So to summarize from this project, um, what will turn out after I look at the experimental results and the decomposition of policy views is that the major driver of support for taxes or lack of support will be the perceived fairness and distributional benefits of taxes, followed very closely by the views on government, which is almost ironic because those are the things that as economists, we typically at least try to stay away from. Uh, we don't try to necessarily shift fairness views. We don't necessarily try to convince people one thing or the other about the government. Efficiency concerns that we deal with daily, and as we understand them, play a much more minor role in people's minds. And this decomposition of policy views will be very much confirmed by the experiment, where it's going to be the distributional video and the economist video that will shift people's views, but not the efficiency video. So in fact, even though the economist video, remember, it shows also the efficiency cost, people end up focusing much more on the distributional impacts and that improves their support for progressive policies. And the major, second major finding is that the partisan divergences are very large and not just in final policy views, we kind of knew that, but on every step of the reasoning. So Democrats are much more likely to believe that taxes have few economic costs, that tax cuts almost never pay for themselves, that people won't change behavior in response to taxes, you know, on the fairness, they have very different views. And then all the way to the polarization of reality which is even on the perception of basic facts about the current system, the views differ. So in the interest of time, because I want to leave some time for the q and I'm just going to tell you in two minutes a summary of this project, and maybe you will be interested in asking more during the Q&A. And then I'll, I'll wrap up to let you ask questions. So this final project, which is you know, fresh, off the, fresh off the print here, is with Christopher Hwitberg and Klaus Kreiner.
It's on social positions and fairness views. So the question we ask here are, how well do people know their own social position within various reference groups? For instance, people with the same education as you, of the same age, living in the same city, uh, et cetera. To what extent do these views uh, on position interact with their views on what they think is fair or on their role of effort, et cetera? And you know, how does this differ for different reference groups? Does it matter more? Are you comparing yourself to people with your same education or simply people of the same age as you? What is the right reference group? So what we'll do here is to actually leverage a very unique um, methodology, thanks to a great link that we can do between subjective data, which will be our own design survey and experiment. We will ask people detailed uh, questions about where they think they rank, views on fairness, etc., which we are allowed to map to large scale administrative tax records in Denmark. We are allowed to match it to people's tax returns going 20 years back in time, even to their parents. And this is amazing because we see not only people's uh, income position, but we see it within various groups. We can compare them to people with the same uh, sector of work, with the same gender, with the same municipality, uh, even people who work in the same plant as they do or in the same establishment. So it's an incredible level of detail to see the reference groups of people, where they think they rank versus where they rank and how that relates to fairness. And so what we will do is to um, look at how well people know their position by being very clear, having explanatory videos to explain what we mean by position. Um, and then we will establish the link between these positions and fairness views in four ways. First, we'll just describe the correlation, which will be quite strong. Then we will look at how over time, over your lifetime, as your history position has been changing, how that's correlated with your, with your fairness views. We'll look at specific shocks, such as whether you've experienced unemployment or promotions at work or disability or hospitalizations. And then finally, we'll look at an experiment where we will show people their true position um, and see how that shifts their views. And so there's plenty more here I can talk about, about how we elicit this. Uh, so again, we ask people to rank themselves with a ladder uh, where they are within various groups, for instance, in their cohort or among people with the same education. And the treatment basically uses the info we know about people to tell them, oh, for instance, on the left, it's someone who thought they were lower, but actually, look, you're higher. And on the right, it's the opposite. It's someone who thought they're actually higher, but we have to tell them in the experiment, sorry, you're actually lower than you thought. And we can see what happens. And our findings are basically that people are quite accurate on their position. Um, there's a almost mechanical mean reversion that happens that we have a trick for solving. So if you look at the graph at the, at the right, if you actually purely rank people by perceived rank versus actual rank, it lines up very closely. And um, you know, there's very small misperceptions on other dimensions too. So people are quite aware of many things. And their views on fairness are extremely correlated, both kind of causally and correlationally with their views, uh, with their positions and where they perceive themselves to be. So this is true if we look at the quasi-experimental evidence of how negative shocks have happened to you and shifted your position. And it's also true in the experiment where those who are told, for instance, they're lower than they thought now perceive things to be less fair and those who are told they're higher than they are now perceive things to be fair. So I hope you have found some interest in these, um, in these four projects uh, that gave you some flavor of the various things we can do with these social economic surveys and experiments. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions and to the Q&A. Thank you.